Well, when uh, uh, we discuss what might be the topic for this year's uh, Wednesday lectures, uh, Rob Mann, who's contributed to a number of uh, them over the years, uh, suggested global warming. <coughs> and I thought it a good idea, important and timely. But uh, after some reflection, I wanted the discussion to be more general about the relations of human beings to the natural world. Some of the speakers will uh, address explicitly the topic of climate change and its moral and political implications. But the fact that we must acknowledge that in relation to the environment we have uh, stuffed it up good and proper, it doesn't, I think, follow that we need to rethink what it is for something to be of moral and political concern, uh, even if we have to think of radical pro political and moral programs. And nor does it follow that we have to develop a new conception of what it means to belong to nature. Or if it does, that will emerge only if we think more generally about our relation to nature. And that's why the series is called uh, Rethinking Our Relation to Nature. Well, every word in that title uh, renders it rather contentious, uh, I have to say. Uh, for some people, that our, Rethinking Our Relation to Nature, invites the question, who is the implicit we? And they might think that uh, the fact that it's there already betrays the thoughtlessness inconsistent with any claim to be rethinking anything. Well, I won't try to answer uh, who that we is, uh, except to say now that the fact, the mere fact that it's a question whose answer is by no means obvious is one of the reasons for this series of lectures. Uh, and it's also the reason why one of uh, the speakers, Deborah Rose, uh, will be speaking about the relations between indigenous and Western understandings of nature. And then there is, of course, the question of what we are to count as belonging to nature, such that it could engage with our sense of who we are and how we should think of ourselves as natural creatures. No matter where you stand on the nature-nurture issue, it's clear that it is at least a reasonable question to what degree the fact that we're animals of a certain species should affect our understanding of ourselves in essential ways. That should what we count as human beings do, or some of what human beings do and create as part, should we count that as part of nature, because these are the natural doings of creatures of nature, the species Homo sapiens, as, are, as much as are the doings of birds when they build their nests, Freya Matthews, who will speak at the end of this series, thinks so, though of course she doesn't think everything that human beings do should be so counted. Typically, of course, people don't think of the protection of old houses as being much the same kind of activity as protecting forests. Uh, they don't think it should be brought under the idea of caring for nature in the same way, but perhaps uh, Freya Matthews suggests they should. Microphysics, astrophysics, neurosciences, on the other hand, all natural sciences, sciences of nature, in all sorts of ways they've contributed to our understanding and enlivened our imaginative sense of what it means to be a human being. But it's also true that their products have sometimes estranged us from that sense. And more to the point, of, uh, in relation to this lecture at least, sometimes when we see ourselves under concepts that are fundamental to these disciplines, we become estranged in ways that I'll try to make more explicit late, later from the very idea that our identity as natural beings is essentially tied to the fact that we're living beings. Well, insofar as I have anything that might count as contributing to a series called Rethinking Our Relation to Nature, uh, it's not because I have much to say about the impact of global warming or about other kinds of environmental problems, nothing practical anyway. My suggestion this evening is that we rethink much recent thought about human, about human beings and their relation to animals and to the natural worlds more generally by rethinking the concept of human beings or the concept of a human being that informs much of that thinking. Especially that aspect that informs much of the lament that human beings have conceived of themselves as radically different in kind from anything else in nature, 
and that that is largely why we're suffering one environmental disaster after another. Well, let me declare some assumptions uh, in this lecture, things that I won't examine, I'm just assuming. I assume that we're evolved animals and also that we have no immaterial parts or aspects. And insofar as philosophical materialism is merely the denial that we have immaterial parts or aspects, then I'm a materialist. Although I emphasize there insofar as it constitutes merely that denial. I don't believe that thinking about our relation to nature in ways that go deeper than uh, responding practically to the mess that we've made of it requires metaphysical thought to sustain not even the idea that our relation to animals and to nature ought to be constrained by limits that look much more like moral limits, not even to sustain a sense of awe or mystery, nor even to sustain an unconditional sense of the love of the world mediated by a sense of its beauty. For most of us, that sense of the love of the world, if, if indeed we have it, is mediated by the beauty that's given in, non, in rather non-problematical ways by the senses. But to some, uh, their sense of that is in fact given and deepened by uh, microphysics, by the microscopic structure of plants, of different kinds of ecosystems, and for others it can be deepened even by geophysics. Uh, I remember uh, many years ago watching a program on BBC television called The Origins of the Universe, which went on for over four hours. Uh, I could hardly understand a word of it, uh, but I was entranced throughout uh, by the evident love of the beauty of the world that was so constantly evinced by so many of those astrophysicists. Uh, and indeed, it's one of the wonderful things about science. Uh, that people in the humanities are sometimes prone to forget that it can be pursued not merely in the spirit of a passionate curiosity, but as an expression of, a, of the love of the beauty of the world. Well, uh, given those declarations of assumptions, you might think I have no space whatsoever for talk of the soul. And it's not so. And I mention it here because it's so often assumed that belief in the soul has been an important part of what estranged us from the natural world, especially from our bodies, uh, or from the flesh, as people used to put it. Well, the immaterial soul, uh, that is the soul of metaphysicians, the one people often think of when they think of the soul, is an entity whose existence is often the subject of speculation. And for the metaphysician, it's not only an hypothesis or a speculation whether we have souls, it's also, we human beings have souls, it's also a, med a hypothesis or <coughs> speculation whether animals have soul. It is, however, there are, however, more natural ways of talking about the soul, as when people talk of soul-destroying work or of suffering that lacerates the soul, or as Simone Weil remarked of the ancient Greeks, that a man loses half his soul the day he becomes a slave, or even when we speak of soul music. And in those cases, the sense of this talk, the place it may have in a person's life, you know, or ha has in our life with language, as I put it later, following Cora Diamond, doesn't depend in any way on speculation about whether there exists an entity which work could destroy or which might be divided in half, or which could best be expressed in certain kinds of music. The conception of a soul that's destroyed by certain kinds of work, that's lacerated by suffering, is not a speculative conception of it. <clears throat> the sense of such ways of speaking about the soul does not depend on the outcome of metaphysical speculation about the existence of immaterial entities. And when someone speaks this way of the soul, one should not ask that person, so you believe in the existence of the soul? That question, or that tone of that question about the existence of a soul, presupposes that it's a speculative matter whether or not the soul exists. And I'm not now speaking of a belief in the soul that I believe in, 
but, but that's not metaphysical. I'm really reporting an aspect that this kind of talk has in our place, in our life, with language. Nor do such ways of speaking of the soul require religious support. If there's a connection to religion, it's indirect, and I would say it's the religious or metaphysical conception that depends on the conception expressed in those more natural ways of speaking that I mentioned earlier. It seems essential to the very idea of religion, it seems to be a kind of conceptual point about religion, that is a point one can see the truth of merely by reflecting on the concept, it seems essential to the very idea of religion that its adherents must claim that it deepens our understanding of what matters to us as human beings, especially our understanding of those facts that define the human condition, our vulnerability to suffering and our mortality, our sexuality. They may, of course, be wrong in claiming that religion or their religion deepens our understanding of it, but we can't imagine because it makes no sense for them to say, well, I know it all does the dirt on life, that it cheapens everything we hold dear, but there it is. What can I say? It's my religion. <clears throat> so it's natural, uh, in fact, it's probably inevitable, that religious people concern themselves with the inner life and its orientation to suffering. Well, talk of the soul in this more natural way, the non-speculative way, is connected with suffering and with the possibility of its going deep. And that possibility appears to be interdependent with a certain kind of reflection. Animals suffer, but they can't reflect on their suffering to any degree. They can't be driven to despair about it, nor at any rate the kind of despair that drives someone to curse the day that she was born. A character in a short story by Isaac Dinesen says, you ask who he was? Well, I'll answer you in a time-honored manner. I'll tell you a story. And that answer is possible only because the concept of a life, as it figures in the idea of a story, that discloses a distinctive identity, who someone is, rather than some of their achievements, is what we mean when we say that a person ruined her life or took a wrong turning in her life, or found her life to be worthless, found in it reasons for joy or for gratitude. The philosopher Rush Rees pointed out that we can say none of this in the lives of animals. We do tell stories about animals, of course, and it's indeed fascinating that we do, and fascinating the role that they have in literature. But the stories do not add up to a biography because nothing in those stories seriously counts as the subject of those stories, when it's an animal, of failing to make something of their life, of taking a wrong turning in their life, of betraying their deepest possibilities, gratuitously or frivolously, and so on. They can't rejoice in their life, nor can they despair of it. And in the absence of all that, we couldn't imagine something counting seriously as a biography or autobiography. Man uh, that is born of woman hath but a short time to live and is full of misery. That's from the Book of Common Prayer. Life conceived in those accents of sorrow and pity is the natural home for talk of the soul. Conceived this way, the soul is non-accidentally the mortal soul. And in saying that, I don't wish to preempt any speculation about whatever might be meant by an immortal soul. I mean only that in its non-speculative sense, the soul is essentially the soul of a mortal creature, vulnerable to misfortune. To think of the soul as the Im immortal soul in anything like the way it's been thought of in the Judeo-Christian tradition is still to retain more than a verbal connection with mortality. Death, where is thy sting? can only be a question for someone for, whose, for whom mortality gravely matters. Well, why then use the word, the soul, you might ask, if it's so likely to be misunderstood in times when the soul is almost universally identified with a non-material substance, the property of certain kinds of religion and spiritualism? Isn't it bound to be assimilated to speculation about the existence of immaterial entities which might or might not survive the death of the body. 
Well, a clue to the answer to this question lies in the fact that it's so, ob so odd to substitute psyche, which is often favored amongst modern translators as the word to translate the ancient Greek word suke, for soul. <coughs> in expressions of the kind that I mentioned earlier. In those expressions, psyche is not a bad substitute for soul. It's no substitute at all. Consider, for example, someone saying, a man loses half his psyche the day he becomes a slave, or psyche destroying work, or psyche music. Well, psyche music might have some <laughs> resonances, but, but in a different, for different sorts of reasons. Well, this way of speaking of the soul is, if I might coin an expression, profound, profoundly enworlded, profoundly of this world. And far from being antithetical to, it depends upon a sympathetic sense of our humanity as essentially defined by certain aspects of our creatureliness. And to make this clearer, I'll draw some distinctions. Firstly, let me just say that there are big facts of human life big, important facts of human life, that we die, that we're vulnerable to chance, that we're sexual beings who appear to become, who become attached to one another in ways that we often can't fathom and which appear to be beyond reason and beyond merit. And people sometimes speak of human nature as having to do with the biological disposition of the species Homo sapiens, as those dispositions are located by those facts or might be indeed in response to those facts. But people also sometimes speak of the human condition in ways different from the way they speak of human nature in the way that I just sketched. When I once asked someone what they took the expression of the human condition to mean, he said with a degree of sarcasm, I don't know, mate, but it seems to mean something like we're all in the same boat. Well, there was quite some truth in that, although I think they not so much in the tone of disparagement. He was right in implying that the expression, hum, the human condition, recorded a sense of fellowship by virtue of sharing a common fate, a sense of fellowship also recorded in the expression, a common humanity. Indeed, I'd say the fellowship recorded in the latter expression, a common humanity, depends on that recorded in the former, the human condition. Because both imply a reflective, self-defining responsiveness to the big facts of human life. Martians may know the facts of human life and they may speculate on the biological causation of our feelings and so on. But <clears throat> for them to be responsive to the resonances of the expression, the human condition, that they would have to be inward with the ways we have been defined by our reflective responses to the human, to the big facts of human life in a way that could be true only if they counted as one of us, which of course, since we're using them as Martians, they're not. And that's indeed part of the point of saying that the expression, unlike the expression human nature, carries with it a sense of fellowship. So when the Greeks spoke of human beings as the mortals, they recorded not merely the fact that human beings die, but recorded that fact in an accent of pity. The same accent I remarked on when I quoted from the Book of Common Prayer. And to speak of misfortune is to speak of chance in the same accent. You can perhaps see why it would seem to someone who holds this conception of the soul that animals don't have souls. And the reason is not because he thinks they're so lowly as to be undeserving of soul, but rather because the conceptual connections between this way of speaking of the soul and certain reflective responses to suffering means that the concept has no application in the case of animals. Such a person may, of course, be mistaken, and I, indeed I think there's a case for thinking that he is. But the mistake is not a metaphysical one, nor necessarily a scientific one. I say not necessarily a scientific one, because though the idea that I've sketched about animals may, in a person's mind, depend on false factual 
beliefs about animals, that is, a person who thinks that animals can't have souls in the way that I've sketched the concept of a soul, may think that because he has false factual beliefs about animals. It need not be the case. Well, our attitudes to animals have changed significantly over the recent years, and I think it's not just because we're more repulsed by cruelty to animals, but partly because, as well as having a sense that we should care more for their welfare, we've also developed a sense that we should care more for their honour or for their dignity, and indeed that were we to do it, it would transform our sense of what it is to care for their welfare. It's difficult to know why this has happened. It's less to do, I suspect, with the kinds of arguments that have been developed by philosophers than it has to do with programs made by people like David Attenborough, which have evoked in people a sense of, one, a sense of wonder at the beauty of the world, at the natural world. But insofar as it has had to do with the arguments of the philosophers, the idea that our attitude to animals has been distorted by what philosophers have called speciesism, which they think of as a prejudice of the same kind as racism and sexism, and no less defensible, that argument has been the most influential. Now, I don't know who first invented it, but it's been made most famous by Peter Singer. It's a simple and powerful idea to treat a human being differently because uh, from a dog, just because she's a human being, the thought goes, is as irrational as treating a black person differently from a white person just because she's black and the other's white, and so on. Thus, when speak, people speak of animals and human beings, they're now often reminded that human beings are animals too. Human beings and other animals, we're told. That's the proper way to put it. Well, more often than not, uh, the reminder that we're also animals would be a polemical retort and one that can generate controversies in which it's hard, I think, to see the wood for the trees. It has the form of a reminder, but of course no one really has forgotten that human beings are also animals, creatures of flesh and blood, that our children grow in their mother's womb, are suckled at their breasts. Our understanding of those definitive facts of the human condition that I mentioned earlier, our sexuality, our vulnerability to misfortune, our mortality, these are determined through and through by our creatureliness. Like other living creatures, we die, we don't just break down. Ashes to ashes, to ashes dust to dust, rather than rusting or just recycling. That's the manner of our ending. So often when people say that human beings are also animals, they mean to say that reference to the species to which a creature belongs can never of itself be a good reason for treating it one way or the other. If it's absurd to think we should sacrifice as much for a dog, for example, as we would for our children, such a thought goes, it's not only because the dog is a dog and our children are human beings, it must be because of other objective differences between them which we take to be morally salient. There are plenty of differences, of course, between human beings and dogs that justify treating human beings differently from dogs, and no doubt these differences are a function of their species membership. But, this thought continues, it's those differences that one should appeal to when justifying the way we treat dogs and human beings differently rather than to species membership. To appeal merely to the fact that she's a dog, to justify putting her down rather than granny, is to be guilty of speciesism, just as one is guilty of racism if one appeals merely to race or to colour, or sexism if one appeals merely to gender.
Well, many people who took the approach uh, that an attitude expressing speciesism uh, is of that reprehensible.